Of the 71 candidates vying for the presidency in 2019, just five are women. Eunice Atwejide of the National Interest Party is hoping to make her mark in the presidential elections in 2019. On this episode, we find out how she intends to do that. You're watching Race for Asurok here on Roots TV Nigeria. Though Nigerian women have been active in politics since before independence in 1960, they are yet to find their footing in the country's political leadership. Until the elections of 2019, only two women have ever attempted to contest for the presidency. In 2003, Sarah Jibril became the first woman to contest a presidential election in Nigeria, while Professor Remy Shonaya of the Koa Party was the second in 2015. Both did not fare well. For the 2019 elections, the number of women in the race for Asurok is five, and Eunice Atwejide is one of them. As a businesswoman, lawyer, filmmaker, wife and mom, Atwejide believes she has what it takes to occupy the number one seat in Nigeria. For some people, they probably haven't heard much about or ever heard about the National Interest Party. So just in a bit, give us an idea of your mandate and what your plans are. Uh, in terms of National Interest yes. Party, oh, National Interest Party, we are a group of quite young Nigerians. I'm just 39, but I'm one of the oldest at the National Interest Party. We started from law school when we were at law school, and we we're all seeing what it was like to be a Nigerian, and especially for those who could barely feed the neighborhood. The people were always in one conflict or the other. The children were on the streets. The women couldn't pay hospital bills. There was just always a lot of troubles that we had to be coming in and helping out, doing charity, raising money to help. But we decided to look into it a bit more holistically and we realized that the only way to actually help is to get into government. Uh, initially, we're thinking maybe uh, a movement, but we realized movements, they only listen to you when you can put pressure on them during elections, but thereafter you're useless. So we need to get in. And getting into the existing political parties was nearly impossible, not on the level we wanted to operate. So we formed the National Interest, Interest Party, Party to come in there and bring good people to government and from there start changing the story of this country. Interesting. I spent a bit of time learning about your party, reading your manifesto online, and I noticed that, you know, you're big on integrity, and most yes. importantly, you are an online party, if I can use that, <laughs> you know, use that word, you're more designed for online presence. Mm -hmm. Now, um, before we even go on to, you know, getting to know your qualifications or how you fit into the presidential post, I mean, think about it. Stats say that 80% of, or rather 80 million Nigerians have access to the internet. And we're about 180, 200 million people. Yes. So you're just reaching about 80 million people online. Yes. What about the 100 million or 120 million? How do you plan to get to them? Or you don't plan to get to them? Um, it's a bit of a misconception to think that we're strictly online. We are online. We are fundamentally online. We do a lot of our discussions online. We do a lot of our meetings virtually. We have people from the diaspora, from every part of this country, taking part in the formation, the uh, administration, and uh, uh, functioning of NIP. But we also have these same people out there in the villages, in the towns, in the suburbs, Talking with people and even registering members. My father and my uncles, they are all members of NIP even though they don't really know how to use the internet. It's now that the internet is becoming really interesting to them. They're like every day learning something new because their daughter is forming a party online. <laughs> so there is a lot of work we're doing to get the unusual users to become comfortable with the internet and it's another way we're educating ourselves because education is one of the things we lack like seriously not just in terms of formal education but general knowledge other candidates are pulling out their policy document from the president to you know atiku molalo ezekwesili and so on do you have a policy document <laughs> policy document was released on the 17th of february 2017 mm. And that was the NIP manifesto. And then mine was released on the 20th of July 2018. That's the Unisa 2 policy document. So I don't know why they waited so long to do this. It's the first thing you do 
when you come out to run for the presidency. Okay, tell us a bit about yours, Finis uh, Tragedy Policy Document. What are the, what's your focus? What are the sectors that you want to pay most attention to if you become president? As president, the primary focus, I am going to be focusing on everything in Nigeria because everything is broken. However, there are four areas that we think, okay, this is like, Today, 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 we need to do something here fast. And that's security, that's electricity, power generally, that's uh, education and that's health. So we have health, education, power and um, security as the topmost priority for us in the first few days in power. So Could you give us a bit of an idea, you know, give us a bit of specifics mm -hmm. of how you intend to tackle it? Because let's talk about security is like number one, if not number one, like very much up there yeah. in terms of a priority of what to fix in this country. Yes. I mean, you just heard of what happened, the soldiers that got killed in Borneo, and then you're hearing of Boko Haram insurgencies. And then let's talk about, you know, militancy in other parts of, you know, Nigeria and the headsman crisis. Yes. Using that as a template, how do you intend to solve that problem? Um, a lot of these problems you see, it's because we have very incompetent people in charge of our uh, security outfits in Nigeria. And not just very incompetent, all of them or most of them are from the same area. And then if you look at it, a lot of the agitation, a lot of these killings you see, for example, the headsman crisis, you trace it back and you see that a lot of the Fulanese, who are also the leaders and the controllers of our military, our navy, uh, they're all from the same area. There would naturally be the sentiment, I cannot kill my brother, I cannot kill my uncle, I cannot kill my son, I cannot stop them. They don't even bring them to book. They don't even, okay, don't kill them, but at least stop them from doing the things they are doing. There's that sentiment. We need to remove that. We need to open up our security agencies, put the best of us. There are very, very wonderful, highly qualified experts in our security outfits whether it's the military or navy or police wherever you look but they're not the ones at the helm of our affairs so the decision makers are the wrong ones the ones that should be making the decisions would come in under my administration and then you would open it up so that everybody from every part of the country is part of the decision making and the implementation process then in military intelligence police intelligence intelligence generally you need to gather intelligence and you need to work with the people the locals and maybe if there's need bring in some uh, external uh, assistance to help to make sure that you are watching these things before they happen you are stopping them from happening many of these cases where you hear that kids are kidnapped there's one name before it happens, but on the day you are one that this is happening, you see that everywhere is clear. The entire force is taken away and sent somewhere else. So amongst our security people, we have those who are working hand in hand with the evildoers, and we shouldn't. And if you have people diverse, like from every part of this country involved, there's no way all of them will be conniving and allowing our people to die just because. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I would definitely do. Make sure that there's different levels of experts in this securing Nigeria business and make sure that they are from every part of Nigeria so that they can be more objective in the way they make the decisions and the way they apply the strategies that they design. Okay. Of course, you have to increase the equipment and training and there's so much to do from what i have read your experiences border on your businesswoman you're a lawyer and you're a filmmaker a little bit so <laughs> yes, i did i did i did i did read about you but um uh, with this put together how does this qualify you to be president these experiences how does that qualify you to be president everything i've done in my life has always been people management and that's the first job of the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. You need to be able to manage the people. You need to be able to manage the expectations of the people. You need to be able to manage the resources of this country. You need to be able to apply funds where they are most needed and stop the leakages that happens every day. And that's what all my experience is all about. Whether you think of me in terms of a mom, or you think of me in terms of a lawyer, or you think of me in terms of a filmmaker, everything I've done in my life was always about managing people, managing expectations, solving problems, and high, high, high intensity problems sometimes. And I've done them quite successfully so far. So why not apply all that to Nigeria and get us moving forward? Let's look at it this way. 79 candidates, just five females vying for presidency. You're female and you're just 30. Nine. Ooh. <laughs> so how do you intend to succeed in this quest to become the president of Nigeria, considering some of these seen barriers to things? Uh, there to are 84 that? million registered voters in Nigeria. 60% of them are under 30. 
they don't have these biases that you're thinking. No, they don't. They are young, and that's my power base. Those mm-hmm. are the people that are taking me to the presidency. My political party, for example, like I said, 80% of them are under 30. There's mm. just only about 20, 10 to 20% of us who are over 30. That's my group. So you did your math. The I did my math. Take you I to the presidency you know where you're focusing. I have the list of voters. I'm going to be calling them one after the other. Okay, guy, you you are 25. You cannot vote for these people that are 70. Eh, woman, is that a problem for you? No, no, I'm not born you. Uh, a guy walked out, man. This is pretty interesting. <laughs> You seem to have a All right, let's talk about you even more. I mean, your party is about integrity, isn't it? Yes. But then quite recently, sometime in August, you were embroiled in a bit of a, a party politics where the yeah. National Executive Council uh, yeah. of your party accused you of forgery and yeah. high-handedness and misconduct. Um, yeah. So when any person reads that about yeah. you and then the cloak of your party is integrity, it will raise eyebrows about you. How do you respond to that? Uh, it raises eyebrows for those who don't dig, like you obviously because if you had dog you would have seen that it was just all yeah you, re- you refuted that <laughs> you refuted that in different media but i'm asking you yeah one one. okay let me do you yeah you're, you're really that. sweet nobody asked me that question okay only one i think Paul's I TV. All kinds of yeah but questions. that's absolutely great because you then give somebody the opportunity to divert some of these stories and that's great it's an opportunity and i'll take it now national interest party uh, we don't have any political godfathers or funding sources and everything so we've self-funded everything and 99 percent of the guarantees we had to give came from me so we took a lot of loans quite a lot of loans to get the party moving and get our policies out there and get our candidates ready and everything and i guaranteed most of it now these people are saying that i'm spending party money where is the party money where does it come from who donated it who brought it so at the end of the day 90 percent of the money we spend in nip comes through me either from my own personal post or from the borrowings i have done guaranteeing them personally on behalf of the party so there is no funds to steal so until funds are there to be stolen that one is not even worth spending time on in terms of um high-handedness it's not even possible everything we do at nip we literally discuss everything because we do work with whatsapp mm-hmm. we have our bot we have our neck we have the members area we have our media area and all. we discuss absolutely everything to the point of what i wear but of course you have those who do not really understand the vision all these ones that want quick money and they don't understand why you won't go to pdp and collect money why apc is calling you and you're telling them to you know you don't want to listen you don't want to even come to the negotiation table you have those ones that don't understand that kind of stance i'm glad you brought that up because a lot of parties i mean 39 candidates they are people have started even adopting consensus candidates and all of that is that possible with you where are we going to see that are you in this race so that you can drum up support get your voters and at some point at a critical point you can either sell that off or <laughs> <you can build. laughs> well, what, what, what <laughs> well, of course if you're taking your money to a line that's selling isn't it so okay. is that a possibility um before i joined the race from 10th january to 10th june my job was just to bring all these new guys together at national interest but i wasn't even at the age to run i was th- i mean i was 38 at the time turned 39 in august so i wasn't even qualified mm-hmm. to run mm-hmm. until the not too young, young to, to run, run bill was passed, passed. to law uh-huh. so that happened i think around may june july i can't remember but until then i couldn't run and be- before we came into the race as a party mm-hmm. with a presidential candidate ours was to get all the guys together whether it is Mogalo or Durotoye or Chowere, Ahmed, Garba, all of them. The idea was bring everybody together. Let us pick one person through a very democratic process and all of us will support that person. By the time you are putting your 10 kobo and putting my 50 kobo, you are putting everybody puts their money in one pot and it is just one person we are going with. We are highly likely to displace this so-called status quo potentially even win the presidency in 2019 Mm -hmm. but the guys didn't want that everybody wanted to have their names on the ballot sheet nobody was ready to discuss or step down for anybody Mm -hmm. or even go through a democratic process to emerge everybody just wanted to do their thing so we thought about it at nip and we said look thank god for this new law mama you're better than these guys go show them now realistically what are your chances of winning the chances are realistically. I mean, I mean from the from chances this, the people's point of view, they probably write you off. But you know, you are the one with this vision. Are 
chance. as good as any other person's chance. Why? Because you never know. Who tells you that Buhari may not fall down dead tomorrow? Ooh. You never, never know. Mm. Who tells you that Atiku may not decide that, ah, my God, let me just quickly fly to Dubai again and then they hold him and he's Dubai or go to America and they imprison him there? You never know. Who tells you that Shuare will not go out and somebody that he blackmailed in Sahara reporters will just shoot him and he's gone? You Ooh. never know. <laughs> hey, so you stay there until it is done. That's when you now know at the end. When the votes are counted, that's when you now finally know. So to decide that because everybody is saying what they're saying, you are going to start feeling dejected or something. That's not the way I think. That's absolutely yeah. interesting. Okay. So what what happens next after all of this? I mean, if you don't win. If I don't win, I go back to my life. That's the great thing about me. I've, yeah. got, I've got plan A, B, C, D to mm-hmm. Z. Mm-hmm. I am ready for the presidency to win. I don't win. Big deal. I go back to my law. What if you were given? What if you were given an opportunity to serve in whichever government that wins? If it is APC, never. I'm not going to work with them. Forget it. However, if it is PDP or AAC or ACN or any of the other parties, like absolutely any of the other parties, I'm willing to go in there and see what I can do to help mm-hmm. us create a mm-hmm. better Nigeria. But if it is APC, I beg I no do. Thank you. <laughs> you are almost done, but you're pretty eccentric. How does that work for you? I mean, I'm sure, I mean, uh, come on, you, 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 you've got an ankle chain. Oh, got, yeah. You almost came out with a blonde wig and all of that. You know, you're running for presidency. How does that work for you? How do people respond to you? I do me, and a lot of people get it. They get it. I'm not here to play nice. I'm not here to play stupid. I'm not here to be anybody's stooge. I'm me, and I want every Nigerian to see me for who I am. And those who would love me would love me. Those who would hate me would hate me. And those who would just be, now you need now. That's it. All right. Uh, uh, last, uh, uh, the, the last thing we do here on a race for us, the rock. You've got just one minute. Look into the camera. Talk to that Nigerian and convince him or her to vote for you. Okay. Ah, and Nigeria left with this one. I was speaking English to talk to Nigerian people, so I beg on that. <laughs> Whether you're an educated person or I mean, I those my friends from market where they come visit every time I beg on I just won't vote. Eh? I won't vote, they decide something for this country. I'm gonna throw up for you now. I'll be on a girl. I'm trying to vote. vote. Eh? I'm gonna do on a better. I will lead this country well. Everybody will be happy. Everybody will be successful. Young, old, woman, man. Everybody will get the opportunity. Eh? Vote for you <laughs> It may seem an uphill task for a woman to become the president of this country, but Eunice Atwejude believes that her chances of occupying that seat in 2019 is as good as all the other candidates. What do you think? How far do you think she can go in this race? Share your thoughts with us on the comment section of this video or via our social media platforms. You can also subscribe to our YouTube page and visit our website www.rootstv.ng. You've been watching Race for Asurok here on Roots TV Nigeria.